Finally, we arrive in Renaissance Rome, the city where Raphael was called when he was 25 years old in 1508 by Pope Julius II, probably under the inspiration of Raphael's compatriot from the Marquet region and, and near Urbino, the architect Donato Bramante. This is the city where Raphael would spend the rest of his life and produce some of the grandest works of the classical tradition ever painted and designed because he also became an architect in Rome. So we'll talk a little bit about Rome that he found, when he, what the city was like when he got there, um, what the context was within which he was working, and the kinds of things that he was expected to do as an artist at the papal court. The Rome that Raphael found um, was not a lot different than the one that Petrarch knew in the 14th century. Uh, it was still a city of ruins, ancient ruins. Um, the, the Roman Forum was buried even more so, much more so than it is uh, today. And very little of what we think of the great achievements of the Renaissance were yet to be accomplished. There were a few, but not all the ones that we tend to think of as the, as the hallmarks of the high Renaissance. This is what Petrarch describes. You can imagine he's looking at a view almost like the one we see here. Here was the castle of Evander. There the temple to Carmenta. Here the cave where Cacus dwelt, there the she-wolf nursing her twins, and the fig tree, more properly called the Romularis. Here the spot where Remus crossed over, the wall. There the site of the circus races and the rape of the Sabine women. Here the marsh of Capra, where Romulus vanished. There the place where Egeria and Numa met. Here were the three brothers swore their allegiance over swords. But this was also the city of Julius II the warrior pope who was transforming the Italian peninsula and transforming the arts in Rome. Um, he's the patron of Michelangelo and the Sistine Ceiling. And so these two, as they were described, terrible personalities in the sense that they were commanding and, and awe-inspiring, were, were in, in many ways um, remaking our whole idea of what constitutes the, the Renaissance. And empowering Michelangelo to work on the Sistine ceiling meant that essentially he was um, derailing him from working on the tomb for himself that, that Julius had originally commissioned from Michelangelo. This is the home of the papacy, obviously, so it's in many ways a kind of a global capital. It's an international city. And it was in the process under Julius of basically transforming or transplanting um, Florence as, as a destination for artists and the place where, where the most remarkable things were happening. It was also a teatro mundi. It was a great stage. And for Raphael, here in the Stanza della Segnatura, the first place he was called to work by Julius, uh, the room that's known as the, the Sanza della Segnatura because it's where uh, documents were signed after Julius's day, but in Julius's day it was actually his private library. But even though it was a private library, it was in the papal palace and it was a public space in many ways. And it was going to be for Raphael a great stage where he could show his abilities and where he would also create a kind of a all-encompassing world in this room that would mark a kind of a new sense of achievement in the Renaissance. He's asked to paint philosophers in the School of Athens. He also has to paint theology on the opposite wall. He paints uh, the poets and muses on Mount Parnassus, and he paints justice and an allegory of justice on the fourth wall. Raphael was painting in fresco, a medium that he'd been working on since he was a boy, and he has spent his whole career essentially working in fresco. Unlike Michelangelo on the Sistine Ceiling, who kind of learned on the job up there on the scaffolding of the Sistine Ceiling, he really had almost no fresco experience, whereas Raphael really was experienced. But what he's asked to do is not simply paint a beautiful painting. He's asked to represent in the School of Athens a kind of comprehensive idea of what the idea of philosophy was and how it might relate to theology on the opposite wall. Much of what Raphael was, was learned on his own. He, as we saw, he's, a, he's an autodidact. He absorbed lessons from his contemporaries by drawing, imitating, and emulating them. He was constantly after self-improvement, and he never really stopped until his untimely death, almost 12 years later. He had a lively mind. He was capable of grasping concept, concepts quickly uh, and essentially without what we might call very much book learning. Um, what formal education he had was from his father and his family associates, after which what he learned he must have learned through conversation with his clients, with his humanist advisors, and more educated artists that he encountered. And what he does is represent this 
kind of summa uh, in a way of philosophy with the humblest materials available. And that's what we're going to be talking about next week is the actual medium and technique of fresco painting. These are the kind of pigments he would have had access to, the brushes, the kind of brushes he might have used. And it's the humblest stuff, the simplest brushes, pigments that are mostly earth pigments, so they're literally dirt from the ground, lime and sand, which cost virtually nothing. And out of that kind of um, raw material of the humblest stuff, there's a kind of alchemy that transforms it into the representations of the great ideas uh, of, of the painting that we're going to be talking about in the third week.